Good morning, everybody. Or afternoon or evening, depending on where you're at. Uh, my name is Bo Durbin. I'm going to be doing a session on using good tech to protect from evil tech. And um, let me do some introductions and I'll tell you what that means. Let's get the slideshow going. All right, so I own a company called Zoom Geeks, and what we do is we build modules uh, for accounting software, uh, specifically for the construction industry. That keeps us pretty busy. Uh, this past year, it's been pretty crazy, even with the COVID and everything um, that we're that people are staying super busy, but they are, which is good for us. Um, Happy October. Welcome to Virtual Fox Fest. I'm really glad that uh, Tamar, Rick, and Doug uh, decided to do this again. It's great to see everybody. And October is also, coincidentally enough, Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So I wasn't even aware of this until I was doing some research for this session. But apparently, October has been the Cybersecurity Awareness Month since like 2003. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some of the things that you run into and like what are some things that you can do to protect yourself some of this i'm going to start kind of slow it might be stuff that you already know um, or stuff that you thought about and uh, you really need to get implemented because what you don't want to happen is you don't want a client to call you you don't want to show up to work and open up windows explorer and see this so this is uh a system that got hacked and they were able to go through um, and encrypt uh, about 250, 300 gigabytes of data. And it didn't take very long for them to do that. I spent quite a bit of time researching it. What exactly happened here? How did they get in? Did a lot of research. And I was just, uh, it's, it's gut-wrenching. You don't want to have to go through this. Uh, one of the things that I found interesting, if you look at these, there's some very large files. And um, these, even though you can't see the seconds on here, all of these files were encrypted in a matter of seconds, even though they were very large files. So we're going to talk about how, how could they do that. So who's at risk? It's basically anybody who's connected to the internet. You, you're at risk of getting hit by ransomware. Um, just in the last year, ransomware struck more than 100 federal, state, and municipal agencies. Who got hit really hard were hospitals and healthcare centers. Um, that's the, the people who are going to give you your best chance of a payout. So that was, uh, that was a prime target for the hackers. About 1,700 schools, colleges, and universities, and hundreds, if not thousands, of businesses were hit. The top five ransomware attacks of 2021 so far. Acer, this is the biggest uh, ransom to date that they know of. Is um, They got targeted by Microsoft Exchange Server and um, was hit with a $50 million ransom. The Washington, D.C. Police Department, they had 250 gigabytes of data leaked, and they wanted a $4 million to not release that data. Uh, probably the one that I saw in the news the most was the Colonial Pipeline, because they had to uh, halt their operations. It affected the East Coast. Um, what some people don't know is they, they did pay out a $4.4 million ransom, but the FBI helped claw back about $2.3 million of it. So that's that's our good tech uh, fighting the evil tech. Um, it's still not good. They got away with that much, but the um, it's nice to know that the FBI was working on it. But I wouldn't count on the FBI helping you if you get hit. I think they don't even they don't even look at anything below a million dollars now. Uh, Brintag, which is a chemical distribution company in Germany. Um, had 150 gigabytes of data stolen. They wanted a $7.5 million ransom, but they settled for $4.4 million, but the hackers still got paid. Kia Motors was hit, and we know from internal and external uh, 
um, information that they were hit. But if you talk to Kia, they're denying being attacked. People don't want to talk about it. It's embarrassing, which is um, um, which is unfortunate uh, because I think that leads to just more more attacks coming if people aren't actually working together. So here's some more statistics. A ransomware attack occurs every 14 seconds. Phishing emails are the number one cause of data. Um, attacks have just been increasing more and more. Um, and if you look at just what's happened in the last, uh, just last year between 2019 and 2020, it's almost doubled the amount of uh, ransom amounts that have been paid out. So this is big business for the hackers. Um, here's some other malware statistics. Nine, and 92% of malware is delivered by email. So we're going to talk about email. And you can just see it's grown. It's a big business. All right, so who are the hackers? So this is, um, this is a Russian hacker. It's like known that he's a Russian hacker. He buys nice cars. He goes and does donuts and burnouts in uh, downtown Russia. He's wanted by the FBI, but they're not doing anything about it. So here's a YouTube video if you want to go watch what the hacker's doing with your money after you pay their ransom. There's a whole team of them doing uh, all kind of burnouts and donuts. And um, I've included a link to another article where it shows um, how they're getting away with it. One of the things that I wanted to do with this session is there I I put the session together and I did a test on our our team last Thursday and so I have an hour and 15 minutes to give you about three hours worth of information and that's even after cutting it down it would take days if not weeks to do this so the main thing that I want to come away with from this session is that you guys are at least made aware of what what you need to know and then give you the information where you can go and do some some research. So I don't want to spend a bunch of time on this, but if you're interested, I'll provide enough links that you can go and and check that out. The other thing is is passwords. So there, um, this was a little over a year ago. Some hackers got in and and were able to figure out over half a million passwords, and they just released them in the wild, so they can use your password to. Um, uh, to get into systems, and you may or may not know that you've been compromised until, welcome, our first sign of some good tech, is Chrome put this in. If you've seen this message before, you try and log into somewhere, and it's like, hey, you need to check your passwords because your password has been compromised. It's on a copy of this, this database, and Google Chrome is trying to help you out. So if you've seen this, click on the check passwords and go look at it. And so Google's trying to help you out. You got six, in this example, I've got six compromised passwords that are out in the wild. And then it's just looking to make sure that you're keeping your information clean. It's got 88 reused passwords and I got 24 accounts with a weak passwords. So you wanna, you wanna clean those up. If you guys haven't looked at this, I highly recommend that you do. All right, so the main thing I want to talk about is ransomware. That's what everybody's talking about. And what can you do? What What is ransomware and how can you protect yourself from it? So let's talk about the anatomy of it. So the first thing that happens is the hackers are going to go out and do some reconnaissance. Um, they, they're going to send you an email and they want you to click on it. And uh, most everybody knows if you see an email, and it maybe comes from somebody you know, but the subject is, hey, I thought you might be interested in this. And it's some tiny URL, you know, hey, we're not going to click on that because that's going to be ransomware. Maybe you're maybe you got a relative or someone who's not as hip might click on it. And they're going to call you for help. But I'm, I'm going to assume everybody that's here knows not to click on an email like that. Well, the hackers know that. So they want to put together some emails that you're actually going to click on. So they're going to go to your website. They're going to find as much information as they can and make the, make the email not look like 
uh, a phishing email. And so that phishing email is the number one tool for how they're going to get into your system because it doesn't it doesn't matter um, it doesn't matter how you secure your perimeter or set up your firewall if the person inside your if the person inside your network has access to all of your systems and you can get them to click on a program then that's the best way to um, to, to have something happen inside your system. So let's look at a couple of examples. Well, this is, I just added this slide. Um, I saw this, I thought it would be interesting to throw in there. The cyber crime is up 600% because of the pandemic. So you have a bunch of people sitting at home worried about what's gonna happen and they're getting an email from the CDC or the World Health Organization, they're gonna click on it. And unfortunately, it ends up leading into another kind of virus that they didn't want to get either. So here's an example of an email um, that I received from somebody, and I really wanted to, to open this up. It was, it looks like SharePoint. It came from somebody that I knew, um, but it seemed a little suspicious. I hovered over the view document and saw that it wasn't actually pointed to SharePoint or any URL that I knew, so I didn't open it. Um, here's another example. Um, this email was sent to my brother who does graphic arts work and he does a lot of websites. And what I found interesting about this is, is they, it wasn't just sent to him, it was sent to a whole bunch of people that were higher ups at the company. There's not a single place that they could have gone to to get, get this information. They pulled it from multiple places and sent it to just the right people and called it a copyright infringement. And so that may, most people may say, oh, that looks like a phishing email. But he took it serious because we've had to deal with um, copyrights before. So he's super careful. He doesn't just grab pictures off the internet and put them on people's website. He's always using like the iStock photos and, and making sure that he's got all the intellectual rights that he can to include it in the site. And this is, it's real, you can get sued for that. And he doesn't want the embarrassment. So he's, he's tempted to click on this. And I don't know if he clicked on it or not, but you can see from the email, they actually botched the email. So if he clicked on it, it didn't actually launch, launch everything. But I was curious, so what, what is this thing? Right? Are you guys kind of curious? So I went and I went and pulled that down, not clicked on the link, but actually programmatically pulled it down. And this was the interesting code that I found inside of it. So the first thing it was doing is calling this analyticsnet.top. And what I found was is that would take a couple two to four seconds to run, which seemed like a long time for a URL. But what I think was happening was that was generating an EXE that would have been custom for this particular download. And then it was posting it up to Google Drive to allow it to come down via Google Drive. Now, why would they go through all of this hassle? So the if you have... Uh, a generic firewall and you're doing some whitelisting, that you you may block EXEs coming down from URLs that you don't know, but your firewall may be set up to allow stuff to come down from Google Drive. So I'm not sure exactly the full anatomy of how this thing worked, but that's there it does seem that this top link is actually generating the EXE and this is what actually pulled down the exe now i didn't put all the code after this but basically it's pulling it down it's automating your mouse to click past all the warnings and get that thing running on your your machine and if you're logged in as an administrator that's bad news because now the hacker has access to your system all right are there any questions at this point Just one um, about the warnings from Chrome. 
the question uh -huh. was, if you don't let Chrome save any passwords, will you still see this? Um, well, that's a good question. Uh, probably not. It's um, you have to give Chrome access to your passwords for them to to double check it against the database. So sorry, I'm not I'm not sure on that. All right, then um, later we're gonna I I'm gonna dive into this a little bit more later, but this analytics net dot top I actually dug into it a little bit more. I've got a little bit more information to share, which I'm gonna do later. But if you go to that site now, you're gonna get this from Chrome because it's identified that that particular URL has has a problem behind it. So there there's Google Chrome trying to help you out. But it, initially, if you're one of the first people to get this thing, you're going to get caught. It's only later that they're actually going to block it. The other thing is, is I don't think analyticsnet.top is actually the hacker's URL. They've hacked into somebody's server. Now imagine if that's your URL and something got into your server, something's in your, your range of IP addresses, and now this is the message that people are getting when they go to your website. So you don't want that to happen either. That's that's bad. That, that would take a long time to clean up. All right, the hacker is trying to get the highest access it can to your system. It wants to be able to shut down services. It wants to poke around your network. It wants to get access to the backups. So even if he gets in as a regular user, he's gonna poke around and try and get the name of the administrators and figure out the password. So even if the person that's running is not the administrator, he is gonna try and, and um, uh, figure out what an administrator password is. Once they get in, they're going, once they're in, they're gonna poke around to find all of these different pieces of your system and get uh, what what is called the command and control. So this is a program that is going to call out. It's going to get an encryption key, and is going to go through and do all the dirty work of encrypting your files. And the the hacker this usually doesn't happen in the same day, and it's not automated. It's very targeted. So somebody's going to be there for for at least a couple days poking around your system, trying to figure out how to do the maximum amount of damage to get it where they can get paid. So once they have that installed, then they're going to take several actions and they're gonna try and reach out to all your network shares. And we're gonna, we're gonna talk about how that's done later. They're gonna try and stop services that have valuable uses uh, for them like SQL Server. So they're gonna stop your SQL Server, otherwise they wouldn't be able to encrypt the files and they're gonna locate what backup service you're using. They're gonna try and disable that or destroy those backups. I've dealt with a couple of recovery companies and they've said that it, in some cases, it looks like the hacker got into the system two or three months in advance and actually um, corrupted the encryption key that's used by the backup. So you think that your backup is running normally, but two to three months later, they actually do their attack and you find out that your backup is no good. So we don't want that to happen. So we're gonna figure out ways of getting around that. All right, so that's just a, a recap of the last thing that we talked about. So this happens to you. The first thing is like, hey, no problem. We got backups. We're gonna restore from backup. The problem is, so I dealt with a, a company that went through this, is their backups were no good. Their local backups, um, all the backup files were encrypted. Um, the network backups were encrypted and the offline backups were incomplete because they didn't test them to see if they were actually working properly and it didn't have all of their files. So now you're stuck in this horrible situation of what are you gonna do? You can you can pay the ransom, which I don't, I don't recommend, but business owners have to make make tough decisions, but you're just encouraging more bad behavior. So this particular client did not want to pay the ransom under any circumstances. We just had to try and recover their data. So we had to try and get really creative. 
Um, four months earlier, they got a report from their server that one of their RAID drives was bad and they swapped it out. Fortunately, they held on to it and the drive was actually okay. It was just a false, uh, a false positive on the drive being bad, but I was able to throw that drive into a cradle and read all the data off of it. It just happened to be four months old. Um, then we wanted a punch list of what, what all was um, encrypted. So I wrote a program to loop through, get a name of all the files so we can make a checklist of what we've actually been able to recover. Um, they had data synchronization going on with the web server. So fortunately there was a bunch of data there that we were able to pull back. A lot of the data that they had was actually in their email. And so even though their, their email files were encrypted, they were using IMAP. So I was able to pull down all their email again from the email server wrote a program to loop through Outlook and pull out all the attachments. And that helped pull some of the data back. And then they had a document management system. The hackers would encrypt the files, but not the folders. So all the folders were intact. They happened to have a, a document management system that would put all of their jobs into individual folders. And the job, each folder had the job number and the job name. So we were able to parse through all the folders to get that information back. And then um, they happened to send a copy of their data in to support for like three years earlier. And we were able to pull some information off of that. Off of that. Now, before I've done, a, I could do a full session on this. This was, this was very painful. I, I really don't want to spend any, any uh, time on it. Um, because I, I don't want you to go through this. Let's figure out how we can not get to this point so we don't have to deal with it. So I wanna, I wanna talk about this for a second. If you see this, these are some really large files and you can see from the extension, it's got an MDF and LDF. These are SQL Server files that got encrypted and they're huge. They're 29 gigabytes, 10 gigabytes, 43 gigabytes. And it's like, the, all of this was done in less than a minute. Like how did it encrypt that much data in less than a minute? Well, the thing is, is they don't have to encrypt the whole file to make it useless. So this looks like gibberish, but I can actually read this. Um, I can actually read this data. This is if I open it up in SQL Server. So there, or open it up in uh, Notepad, the, the raw data is still there. What it turns out is, if we look at the, the middle one here, so this is the encrypted file. So the, the, uh, the, this bar represents the entire file where the, uh, the, the green area is the unencrypted part. So you have the pink at the top where they've encrypted the header. They'll go skip through and do parts of the middle of the file. And if you only encrypt parts of the file, it makes the file useless. That's how they can do so many large files in such a short period of time. Does that make sense? So what did we do to get it back? Well, this happened to be, they're using the QODBC driver to um, update their QuickBooks. So this actually worked out pretty good. Um, from a performance standpoint, I uh, had a log in there to keep track of all of the SQL statements. So this was all incremental in a memo field and it just kept adding to the end. So I was able to actually take one of the old from the read drive that was four months earlier and actually pull out pieces of that file and graft it into this file and ended up making, rebuilding the file. Now the red part at the end, that was just because of the process and the cutting off of the files, the ones at the very end, I couldn't use. So I just cut it short and was able to get back uh, more than 99% of the data. But like I said, you don't want to go through this. It's, it's not fun. Let's, let's see if we can prevent this from happening. But the fun part is, is what does this remind you of? When I was putting all this together, it reminded me of Jurassic Park where they would find the, they would get the blood from the mosquito and the DNA would be missing. 
And so they ended up pulling some frog DNA so they could get the, the dinosaur DNA. All right, is there, um, I'm jumping to the next section. Is there any questions at this point? Um, just one, and I'm not sure exactly what it's asking, but he's, it's, you referenced Chrome. Does any of this apply to Edge or other browsers? Um, possibly. I just, I only use Chrome. So the, um, it's, it's a fair question. Um, but I just, I haven't dug that far into it. And one of the takeaways I want people to get from this is just look at these different ideas and see if it's something that applies to you. I'm going to be talking about a specific router. I'm going to be talking about a specific um, backup tool, but the same things apply to other things. So I would, I would hope that Edge would have something. I would hope these other browsers would have something, but just knowing that it's in Chrome makes you want to go look and see if those other ones have it. But I will, I'll try and follow up on these and, uh, and get answers to that. Those are good questions. All right, so how are we going to prevent the ransomware? So it turns out there are some very simple things that you can do. And this is going to sound like a recap, but they're, even though um, people, oh, yeah, yeah, that's simple. I can do that. It's, it's amazing how many aren't actually being done. Right. So let's run Windows updates. Now, I've got some people that I work with. They hate Windows updates because they think that it's going to break something. But the it's it's patching something. All of these attacks that are coming through, these are known issues in Windows and they're they're patching them. The hackers know about it. There's a network of people They get together in their own virtual conferences and they figure out the best way to compromise your system. And they're sharing information about uh, vulnerabilities in your your system and how they can take advantage of it. Now I've got a picture of Windows Update on here, but you want to keep everything updated. Um, I've got an example where uh, someone wanted us to help migrate a website, and so it was originally developed in .NET Nuke. It was really old. They sent it to us. It was easier for me to just load it up, uh, so my brother would have access to it, and then be able to um, uh, migrated over and he was doing a static HTML5 site from it. Well, it kind of got forgotten about and set out there for a few months. And because the ASP.NET for that particular site was not up to date, the hackers figured out a vulnerability and got in and actually got a program installed on one of our servers. So that was not, that was not good. Fortunately, um, my super hip um, cybersecurity guy who helped put this presentation together, um, he found out about it within an hour and notified me. And I'm going to show you how how he let me know and, and what he used to detect that. But if everything was patched, that wouldn't have happened. So you want to keep everything patched. You're especially, especially your routers. Uh, a lot of people kind of forget about doing their routers. And they're that is a big target for the hackers is to try and get into a router. All right, secure your perimeter. And so if you've got a firewall, you wanna block all the traffic that doesn't need to be in there. Um, you also wanna keep logs and occasionally review those logs. And please, please, whatever you do, do not open remote desktop to the world. That is, that's the number one tool they want to try and get in. The hackers are, there's thousands of hackers, if not more, probing port 3389, trying to find a system they can get into. And just all day long, they're trying to figure out how to hack into your system. So don't, don't open RDP to the world. You want to use a VPN or set up your router to only allow certain whitelist, certain IP addresses to let them in. So another Jurassic Park reference, the uh, the Velociraptors were going around testing the fences for weaknesses systematically. And that's what the hacker is doing. They're just trying to figure out constantly, if you're exposed to the internet, how do we get in here? And so you want to secure that perimeter. And it doesn't matter if you're 99% secure. If they find that 1%, they're in. And then they can do whatever they want. 
All right, the uh, employee education. Oh, and, and by the way, I'm skipping over these. I'm going over these important topics really fast. I'm gonna dive into them later. I just want you to see what the, the, the subjects are that we're gonna go into. I'm not, I'm not intentionally just skipping over them after a couple of minutes. All right, employee education. Uh, this is definitely not a last line of defense because you see the hackers are, are using the human element to try and figure out how to get into your system. But it doesn't hurt to train the users to look for suspicious emails and get them trained and you can test that. Create, create a fake phishing email and send it out to your team and see how many of them click on it. So that's a pretty good test. And then you can you can talk to those people and and let them know and keep them trained. All right, so next is your backups. You wanna make sure that you've got secure offsite backups. Um, the, the ransomware is gonna target your backups. It's gonna try and find your backups and it's going to try and destroy them and make it so you can't restore. Because if you can restore from backup, they're not getting a payday. And if they're taking the time to go through your system, they're definitely gonna look for your backups and try and mess them up so you can't restore from them. Um, the other thing is, is not just counting the, the hackers, but make sure you're testing your backups to make sure they work. Um, I, had a, I had a bit of a scare. The, the building that I'm in, which contains um, not just business stuff, but almost all of my personal stuff from moving, the building 20 feet behind me caught on fire. And I'm like, I'm not sure if I have backups of everything that I need to have backed up. So you want to make sure you have backups, not just for hackers, but for other catastrophic events. Um, now, the other thing is, is let's say you are using an offsite backup. You need to calculate how long it's going to take you to get your data back. Um, in the past three years, I've helped several companies recover from ransomware by pulling from their backups. And all offsite backups took at least two weeks to get your data back. So you might wanna plan your backup strategy. Uh, what's what's gonna happen if you're down and how long is it gonna take for you to you get back up? So this is just a recap. This uh, presentation is gonna be out there for you guys to review. But if you just do these small things, you're gonna reduce your risk more than 80%. So we're gonna get into some more clever stuff. How do we close the gap on that last 20%? But this, Everyone should be doing this. Um, make sure that these, these items are covered and that's gonna get you to 80%. Now, the, why does that get you to 80% and, and what, so, what is so special about it? So I hate, to, I hate to say it, but what you're doing is, is you're just making the guy next to you more attractive, right? So it's like the club, everybody's heard of the club, it's there's they're easy to defeat you can you can break them this way you can get them off the steering wheel that way but if someone's trying to steal your car the club is just making the car next to yours more attractive and it's like the story of the the bear it's like if you if you're gonna if you could possibly get attacked by a bear you don't have to outrun the bear you just have to outrun the guy next to you so it's unfortunate but there's a lot of truth there all right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna dive into these these things with some more detail and some actual solutions to these. So this is a good time to take questions if there's any questions. Yep, we have a couple. Okay. Uh, Joel asks, why is an RDP login considered less secure than a VPN login? So the VPN, you're creating a different network. So if I wanted to, if the the VPN is just you're creating a virtual network that the hacker doesn't have access to. And so you could, I'm trying to think of the the goal of your question. The the if if I try and find if I just go out polling IP addresses randomly and check port 3389 and I find if I'm getting a reply, then I know that there's an RDP on that end and I can just hit it. If it's behind the VPN, you have an extra layer of security because someone has to connect to the virtual network and then log in. 
And your VPN should be using double security. There should be a password, a username and password to get you into the VPN. And then um, you should be using multi-authentication. So it should either a code that changes periodically or it sends a, a text to your phone that you can reply to, to, to let you in. Um, so they're not, it, it's just another, another layer that the hacker has to go through. Okay, and Kathy wants to know, so did Bo get the computers out of the building first or the Trans Am? <laughs> um, the, my wife's Mustang got out first and then we pushed out our El Camino and then the police are like, you can't go back in the building again. Like, ah. So it's it's a it's a sick feeling. So fortunately the um, fortunately the fire department was there and they had a ladder truck and everything and they were able to put the fire out. But it was that would have been bad news if I wouldn't happen to be um, working late. I don't know that anyone else would have seen the fire. Would have taken out the whole block. Okay. And while you, in response to your first answer, people are asking if there's any two-factor mechanism for RDP? Um, not that I know of. I'm making some notes here. I'm going to, I'm going to figure out a way of answering these questions. Okay. And boy, they're coming quickly now. Um, does BitLocker help hinder or something else? BitLocker? I'm not sure what that is. Sorry. Okay. It, it's some kind of encoding device. I know I came on, I had I had one computer that it was like there when I start, installed it, but I don't is know. That a, is that uh, one of the multi-level authentication tools where it, uh, it changes the code every hour or something? No, so I, think, if, I yeah. think it's an encryption tool. Yeah, I, I'm not sure, but I'm jotting it down. I'll... Um, I will look into that. Okay. So I'm not a I'm not a security expert. I I just see this as I'm trying to help people out. And if it wasn't for my buddy Chris, who who is a security expert that helped me put this together, um, I would I wouldn't know. So this has been a learning process for me. So I'm sorry I can't I can't answer those, but I'll I will get an answer on those and get back to you. All right. So now we get into some buzzwords. So I told Chris, give me lots of buzzwords. Uh, if I had more time, I would have sent a buzzword bingo card to everybody and we would have played some buzzword bingo. So the next section, this is where we're gonna get into the details. We're gonna use some terminology that, that cybersecurity experts use and how we can address um, um, the, the, these uh, easy, easy, preventive measures that we just talked about. All right, so pen testing. So that's short for penetration testing. That's a measurement of how fast a hacker can get admin rights to your network. The easiest way for them to do that is for you to set up your account to be an administrator and log in as an administrator all the time and accidentally click on one of these emails. Now they're in your system as an administrator. So what this was, this was the biggest thing for me that Chris brought up is don't log in as an administrator. So his solution was create a separate admin account. So whatever your username is, just make it a regular user. That's what you log in and work in all the time. I know that there's, there's sometimes that isn't gonna work, especially for Fox Pro and that's the next slide. But then create another one and it's like user underscore ADM or come up with your own naming convention. And then that user has admin rights and use that user to do the things that administrators need to do. If it's um, installing software, installing drivers, and it's easy enough to toggle, right? Because you can, um, you can do right click and run an application as an administrator. So where does this come into a problem for Fox Pro developers? Well, if you're creating a project that has an OLE public, so it's actually gonna generate COM. If you're not logged in as an administrator, you're going to get this message. 
access to the registry denied. So it's going to compile your exe, but it's not going to be able to write any of your com stuff to the registry. And this, this I think, is probably the number one reason why Fox Pro developers end up running Fox Pro as an administrator, just to avoid this message. But don't log in as admin. If you need to run Fox Pro, if you need to compile a com component just that one time, right click on Fox Pro, run it as administrator, and then log in using your admin account. You're going to, it's going to make your whole system safer if you do that. Now, of course, there are some gotchas from this. There's probably people that are already doing this and they know the gotchas, so I'm going to try to share those. So here's, here's a couple different message boxes. If I'm logged in as B Durbin, as not an administrator, and I've got a Z drive mapped, then I'm going to be able to see it. But if I log in as the administrator and I don't map the same drive, then I'm going to see Z drive doesn't exist. And so some of these issues people are used to working with going all the way back to Vista. But you are logged in as a different person and you're going to have to set up your environment with both of them if you're going to um, if you're going to do things this way, just be just be aware that when you are running as an administrator, that the environment is going to be slightly different. All right, antivirus. Everybody's been running antivirus for years, so now they have what they call the next gen antivirus. I highlighted next gen because that's what all the the cool new hip stuff is called. It's next gen. So the next gen um, antivirus is what makes it different over conventional antivirus is that the old antivirus would just look for patterns. So it was like profiling an EXE to see if it had a same signature as a known um, issue or known uh, malware and um, take an action against it just because it matched a pattern. But that's that's no good. Just the example that I showed earlier, the email from my brother, they're, that's one of the things they're getting around here is, is they're generating a different EXE every time somebody runs it just so they can change the pattern. Now, I don't understand all these terms, but I'm throwing these buzzwords in there for your own uh, research that you do after this. But these... Um, the big advantage of the next gen antivirus is it actually puts some intelligence into it. It's, they're not just looking at the EXE to see if it matches a pattern, but what is it actually doing? Is it, is it doing things? Is it, is it talking to your endpoints? Is it, um, um, the, what, what are the actions that it's taking that make it more, more uh, suspicious? And it's more tied into a network so you can get an instant response. It's like, hey, the hackers are getting together and figuring out uh, ways of hacking you. Um, let's have these intelligent um, antiviruses talking to each other. And uh, once it detects something, we can push it out on a database and have it pushed into these other machines more quickly. So it can, the antivirus can evolve as fast as the hackers are evolving, if that makes sense. So what a, the, big, the big question, um, I don't see the questions, but I assume it's like, hey, what's the best antivirus to use? So I asked Chris, and Chris is like, I choose Windows Defender, which I found very interesting. It's like, you're just going to use what's built into Windows? That doesn't make any sense. He's like, if you do all the other things before this, the Windows Defender works just fine. It's most of what these, th what these other antivirus tools are going to do for you is because it got through these other perimeters that, that weren't protected. Uh, but he, he did provide me this resource. So there's um, a group called the PC Security Channel, and they take all the latest antiviruses and they compare them to all the latest ransomware attacks and actually rank them. And so um, I can't tell you which one is going to be the best for you, but I would recommend going and looking at the, the reviews that these guys are doing. They've got tons of, of subscribers, 20 million views, and this it looks like a great resource uh, for doing that type of research to find out what's going to work best for you. 
So next is the firewall. So what are we gonna call the firewall? Well, it's a next-gen firewall. So how is this different from a regular firewall? Well, a next-gen firewall is going to uh, provide some more intelligence to it. A con conventional firewall is you're just gonna say, well, we're gonna let this port through uh, to this machine. But if you're opening up port 80 or port 443, which are the web ports, you're letting everything through. Well, let's have some more intelligence on there. So what a next-gen firewall will actually do is it can actually dissect uh, the traffic that's coming through and actually look at it. Now, the, the big thing there is, is the SSL encryption. Um, it's, it's somewhere between 85 and 90% of all traffic is going over SSL and a conventional firewall can't see any of that traffic because it's all encrypted. So what a next-gen firewall can do is it actually can interject itself and decrypt the, uh, the data that's going through the firewall, and you can actually make rules on it. You can check the content. You can do uh, what they call application inspection um, based on the type of traffic that's going through, what, uh, what, what software does this belong to, and and have a lot more control over how your firewall works and what it does. Now this next-gen firewalls have actually been around for a while, but they're really expensive until recently. So here's another, another slide. It can do deep packet inspection, um, look for dangerous traffic. And who makes it? We've got Checkpoint, Cisco, Dell, Barracuda, Fortinet, Juniper, Palo Alto. So all the major router, Firewall manufacturers are are doing this next gen technology, but the one that um, I'm going to talk about is the Fortinet. That's the one that Chris likes. So the other thing, I don't I don't completely understand all of these layers, but I'm going to put them in here because it's part of the buzzword bingo. And the what you're looking for is a router that can do all seven layers. A typical a typical router is gonna stop at around layer four or layer five, but being able to have at your presentation layer, being able to get past the SSL and actually look at your application layer, which is level seven, and actually write rules against that is a big deal. So here's the firewall that Chris set me up with. So this is a Fortinet firewall. You can, you can get them as cheap as 400 bucks. So if you have a small business, um, and you want to get some of this newer, super great technology, uh, Fortinet is a good way to go. The, the other thing that I like about this, and this is, this is kind of where the topic of this, um, this session came from, is using good tech to protect against evil tech, is because this is, it's networked in. So you've got hundreds of thousands of these firewalls out there that are hooked up. You can sign up for their support service and your firewall is actually talking to a central database. And so let's say the firewall detects a hack that's happening in, I don't know, some city that's thousands of miles away from you. The firewall is going to detect it. It's going to shut it down, but it's also going to report back to the central database that, hey, we're getting some hacking coming from this IP address. Oh, yeah? Well, we're going to send out a message to our hundred thousands of subscribers, and now their their routers know about that IP address, and they can go ahead and and shut it down. So to me, that was that was huge when Chris first told me about that, and that kind of prompted uh, looking for more of this this good tech, the battle, the evil tech. Um, the other thing that's nice about this router, if you've if you've been shopping for for routers slash firewalls is that it actually supports multiple external IP addresses. Um, a lot of them that I looked at a couple of years ago, they could only handle one external IP address. But if you've, if you've got a range of IP addresses or even multiple providers coming into one building, you can set it up to support those multiple IPs or providers. And Fortinet has an entire ecosystem 
So I put a link there to their website. They have all kinds of products. They're super security centric and they've got some some really interesting stuff. I'm still, Chris is still bringing me up to speed on it. But I liked, um, I liked seeing all the different things that they were doing. The only thing I have from them right now is their, their Fortinet firewall. But I'm starting to look at some of these other products, the cameras specifically. All right, so this is a good time to take questions. Is there any questions? Nope, we have nothing since the last batch. All right. All right, the next thing that Chris told me about was this Huntress Labs. So these guys are really interesting. So here you've got a team of people that used to work for the NSA, and they're Chris called them the red team. I'm not sure what that means, but their jobs were they were on the offensive side of cybersecurity. They're basically hacking into other nation states. So these guys decided to form their own company to help protect um, Americans or, well, I shouldn't say Americans. I'm sorry, I'm, um, because I live in America, but they're, they're protect more, more, um, more people from hackers. So their slogan is cybersecurity for the 99%. So what these guys have done is they have created a program. Well, let me go back one step. One of the things that they noticed as they would hack into these systems is that they could get in and they would create something that was persistent. So it would, what they would call a persistent foothold. So this program is running all the time. If someone clicks on an email, you might get them to run the program once. But if you want to go into that machine multiple times, you've got to uh, find some way of making the program persist, run as a service, run as a scheduled task, something that keeps it alive so you can keep coming in. So they would develop that, but they noticed that they would go undetected for long periods of time. And so they became kind of experts on how to do this keep alive and the steps that you would have to do. Well, what they decided to do is they're going to write a program that you can install on your system that looks for these persistent footholds. And so that you can, if they, if they find something like this on your system, they can notify you about it. So this gives, it's kind of like the, the next gen antivirus because it's looking for stuff that's on your system that, that doesn't seem right and can let you know about it. And if I go back to the, the hack that, that we had where it came in on our web server, this is what told us. Chris installed this Huntress on all of our servers. And if anything suspicious comes up, Huntress lets him know. The downside is, is they don't sell direct to consumers. But if you do go to their website, they have business partners that they work with that you can sign up for their service. And they, and I think it's mostly because of the monitoring that they have. And I'm guessing their business model, they'd rather deal with a, a, another layer. They don't want to deal with 10,000 customers when they can deal with a few hundred uh, business partners and only have to train those. If that makes sense. All right, so they've they've expanded. So they're not just doing the persistent foothold anymore. They are doing what's called ransomware canaries. And so if you guys are familiar with the term canary in the coal mine, they actually go and create little tiny files, little lightweight files, and they place them all over your system. And nothing should be touching those files. No, no program should be interacting with them, except ransomware is going to come through and encrypt them, and it's going to detect it. So they can put these files all over your system, and if any, any of those files get modified or changed, they immediately get notified and can notify you that it looks like your system is being um, attacked by ransomware. Now, that's, um, that's all well and good but it's just, it's telling you. It's like that, that commercial. It's like, well, I'm just a security monitor. But what would be nice is, is if they actually like shut it down, right? So I talked to Chris and apparently he's, he has some insider information. 
within the next two to three months, they're actually modifying this so that when it does detect a ransomware attack, it identifies which machine it's coming from and can isolate that machine from the network, which would be great. So I'm looking forward to that. So just going back to one of these files. So they're just gonna, they're gonna be one of these tiny little files that's out there and it's going to um, detect if they change and trigger that, that ransomware canary. All right, Huntress Labs is, is pretty good. These guys are really trying to educate people. So I highly recommend going out there. This is gonna be in the presentation, but if you wanna write this down, they have an enormous amount of information on cybersecurity that they're making available to people. And so they have a blog. And um, Chris said one of his favorite bloggers um, out there he gets a lot of good information from is John Hammond. And I'm like, John Hammond? I know John Hammond. But that's not the John Hammond he was talking about. It's this guy. So if you look out there, Chris is a huge fan of uh, John Hammond's um, uh, blogs and uh, was really impressed with it. But I I read through several of the articles. There, There's a lot of smart people working at Huntress Labs and some good information. All right, it's a good time to take questions. Nothing new. Okay. All right, backups. Chris says the formula for backups is N minus one, which basically means if you have one backup, you have zero backups. If you have three backups, you have two backups. So more backups is good. And what I wanna do is I wanna talk about different types of backups. Cause when I saw that ransomware that hit a local backup, it was, um, it was not good. It's like, what do you do if they're going after the backups? How can you protect your backups from the hackers? And I thought, well, we'll just put it off site. But then I got to talk to that recovery company and they're like, well, no, they're going after the offsite backups. So what do we do? Well, there's what I discover is there's two different types of backup if you want to put them into two categories. So what I would call there's the push backups. And I've worked with all of these and they're all really good. They're really easy to, to implement. Um, you basically install them on their system. They make them very easy for the user to use. But what they do is, is now you've got a service running on your computer that's looking for changes in files, and then it's detecting that change, and then it's pushing those changes um, to uh, a local backup and or an offsite backup. The problem is, is if the machine gets hacked, they have access to this. Oh, I see you're using Carbonite. Oh, I see this is where you're storing your backups. Oh, now we can go, we can stop the service and we can go get those files. All right, but these are what I would call push backups. And I think that's, I think that's a real term, but it, it's just what made sense in my head. Because you're taking, you're sitting on the machine and you're detecting changes and you're pushing them to some other drive or some other service of, of the files that change that you can pull back later. All right, so where I became interested is what I would call a pull backup. And so here we have Veeam. And there's, Veeam is the only one I'm familiar with, but there are other companies out there that are doing the same thing. What Veeam does is it is talking to a virtual machine. So let's say you have a physical box and you've got four virtual machines on it. Veeam gets installed as another machine on your network. It talks to that physical box that's hosting the virtual machines and it pulls a backup from there. And so this was fascinating to me because um, you can, you have the potential of kind of isolating it. The, um, a hacker has to look a lot harder to find that backup. It doesn't, just look at the machine that's being backed up to find your entire backup strategy, right? So then, if you think about it, which is better, push versus pull? Well, which is better? So if you're paying attention, both. So why is both better? Because in minus one, because one of your backups is gonna get eaten. 
So if you're what, um, I've got a couple other um, things I want to show you later, but the way that I like to deal with hackers, if the hacker is going to come in and they're going to hack you, you can try and you can try and block everything. But why not let them think that they won? Let them think that they've they found your backups. Let them think that they took it down, and then you can restore from somewhere else. Just a thought. All right, now it's not really a backup, but I will tell you I've recovered a lot of data because people had Dropbox set up. It's only ten dollars a month. Um, they had files on there that weren't part of the backup. It's easy to share files with other people. Um, you can sync um, Dropbox across multiple sh machines. So I don't know that it's really called a backup strategy, but I can tell you I've restored a bunch of stuff off of Dropbox. One of the ransomware that got hit, it did, it encrypted everything on the drive and all of those encrypted files got synchronized with Dropbox. But Dropbox has a really nice feature. You can go back up to 30 days and say, restore everything back from this point. So we just went back like three days and, and restored everything and they got all of those files back, the ones that were on Dropbox. All right, so what do I like product-wise? So working with Chris and looking at the different options, I like using Backblaze. So there are other other backup providers have some of these same features, but if you're looking at, at getting a backup, these are things that you wanna look for. Now, Backblaze has two different products. They've got a personal backup and they have a business backup. And if you look at some of the other backups that they work the same way, um, there's a different version that runs on a server versus runs on a workstation. So I'm, I'm using both. Um, I like that on their personal backup, I can go back up to 30 days, one year, or forever. They have different plans. I think I'm on the 30-day plan that I can go back and pull files. The big thing for me was being able to order a drive. So if, if you have a catastrophic failure, you're, you get hit by ransomware, your computer catches on fire, and you need, a, you need to restore, you can go through the process of pulling it down and it'll take two weeks or you can contact them and they'll actually burn all your stuff to a, a drive, a USB drive or um, a hard drive and they'll actually mail it to you. And so you can get that overnight. That's way faster than trying to pull everything down over the wire for two weeks, right? Another neat little feature that they put in there is locate a missing or stolen computer. So if you put it on a laptop or something and it's tracking your IP address for you, kind of like your iPhone um, has a location. So it's just a little added bonus. Um, if your laptop, if you can't find it or it gets stolen, they can track it down if it's, um, if the location service is enabled. So the, the business backup works differently. You're not going to be able to install the personal backup on a server, but the benefits are is it works with Veeam. So you can tie it into the Veeam and use it as your um, your offline backup. Um, it ties in with a lot of NASAs. So I like the Synology. So I can use the Backblaze to take my entire Synology NAS and push it up to the cloud. Um, and it, it's giving you, it does have some server backup tools and it has uh, other computer backup stuff and it allows you to manage it from a central location. So you're trying to manage multiple servers. Um, it gives you a single tool to manage that from. All right, any questions on that? All right, I wanna to touch on this, but I don't want, uh, I don't really like it. So there are insurance companies out there, but in my mind, it's, you're just, you're funding the hackers. Now this, this article, which I provided a link to, um, talks about the downside of having ransomware insurance. Uh, but if you go to one of these 
um, cyber insurance, cybersecurity insurance websites, they'll tell you, no, 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 we're not, we're not, uh, we're not funding it. But it's, um, I don't know, I've been around long enough and worked in a bunch of different industries that when, when insurance companies get involved, prices, prices go up. And I think if you have this insurance, it just makes you more attractive to getting hacked. But uh, it may be a good fit for you. So I'm putting it out there. It is, it is a way of helping you get your, your data back. Now there, I will say this about the insurance companies. They don't just automatically pay the ransom. Um, they'll, they'll provide um, some relief if you have to bring your, your data back without paying the ransom. So they're going to help you with that too. All right. So now the now is the fun part. We're going to have some fun stuff. This is this is me just playing around with different um, different ways of dealing with the hackers. Um, so this would be a good point. Are there any questions? Yeah. Sorry about a few minutes ago. I had a technical issue. There had been ah. a couple from before. Um, can okay. you speak to the general range of pricing for Huntress? Oh yeah. Um, so I, I may be, this may be a little biased because Chris, Chris is a provider and he provides the service to me, but it's like $5 per computer per month. I may be getting a special price and, and other providers are different. Um, but I think it's going to be in that, in that range. Okay. And also how are they going after offsite backups? How does that work? So the way that they, the, what the company told me um, was that they would, they know enough about how the backup software works. And anytime you deal with an offline backup, they're going to encrypt that information because you don't want, you don't want your personal data stored in some cloud server that's not encrypted. So what they do is they locate the encryption key and they mess with that key. So your backups, they want your backups to look like you're backing up normally, but um, they've messed with your encryption key. So when you actually go to restore, it's all junk. Okay. Um, and I will add my own, or which was, as I mentioned to you earlier, my husband's company got attacked. It wasn't a ransomware attack. It was something else. And their cyber insurance actually did a tremendous amount of work to clean up their systems and to also do the necessary required by law things that they had to do to inform their customers about possible breaches and so forth. And it was, without the insurance, they would have been in a terrible position. Yeah, that's, that's true. So I would, um, Insurance is not is not a bad thing, as as bad as this is. I would just hate to see insurance being used to to buy Lamborghinis for hackers. All right, so let's have some fun. So the original title of this slide was "How to Make Millions Hacking Other People's Computers," but I decided to change it. So let's go back. I wanna I wanna talk about this email that my brother got. And it's like, what can I do with this information? So I already showed we, um, I was able to pull down that content. Well, how did I pull that content? Because you don't want to click on the link. So you can use um, whatever tool you want. I just happen to use the MS um, XML HTTP driver. So I can go pull that content without actually browsing to it and then do a modify file on it, right? Does that make sense? Everybody's done something like this, right? And then I was able to find these um, these URLs. And so what what was interesting is the first one comes back. The first one, the first link up here, the Analytics Net, to me, looked like it was building the EXE and then uploading it to Google Drive. And then the second link was allowing you to download it. But this guy has to return an ID that it's using here, right? Res.data. So this is gonna it's gonna do a git JSON. It's gonna throw it to um, res 
And so now res can pull this, this data element to finalize the URL, right? So to me, this Google Drive isn't doing a lot of work. This guy right here is doing the work. And so, and it's taken two to three seconds. And if you've ever had to do load balancing and stuff on URL, that seems like a long time. So I wonder what would happen if, I don't know, let's say call that URL like 10,000 times. So that's what I did. And um, it made it to about 2,000 and then just returned um, the status was 500 server error. So that felt pretty good because I'm like, <clears throat> I took those guys down for a while. Oh, I got a cough. <clears throat> so the the next thing is is how how are these guys getting an access to your computer? So that was that fascinated me because one person um, one person got infected in one system, and then they were able to get some program installed on four computers on the network. And we got a listing of all the computers. And then these four computers were actually working coordinated to encrypt as many files as they could four times faster. So it's really easy. So this ARP program, which is built into Windows, can quickly give you a list of all the, all the resources on the network. So you run ARP minus A, and in a fraction of a second, you're getting back all of those IP addresses. So now all you got to do is loop through those IP addresses and do a net view. Put that IP address in there with a slash all, and now you got a list of all the shares, even the hidden ones. I thought maybe I would take some of my um, some of my backups, and maybe if I put them in a hidden share, that they would be protected. No, no, the hackers can get all the hidden shares. And then all they have to do is just loop through now they've got the the machine's IP address. They've got the, in this case, the C drive. And they can just loop through and get all the directories and all the files. And if you've got read write access, they're going to get into all of those. So what can you do to what can you do to protect yourself from this? Well, you can you can isolate your network. And I'm gonna, I got three minutes left, so I'm gonna go really fast. Let's say this is your typical network. You've got uh, a dev server, SQL server, your web and your email. And then let's say you're taking, all of those are virtual machines on your, on your uh, VMware physical server. Well, you can isolate the web and the email by putting them on their own VLAN. So basically they have their own subnet of IP addresses and those computers, your dev computer, your SQL computer cannot see the web or email unless you specifically open it up in the router. So let's introduce Veeam. So now Veeam is gonna be set up on the same network as a different computer, but it's gonna take the VMware and it's gonna be able to pull backups from all of those. So that's neat. But if somebody hacks into your dev server, they have access to the Veeam server, but not the web server. Or if somebody hacks into the web server, they're not going to have access to the Veeam server. Well, let's take that a step further and set up another VLAN. So now your Veeam is on its own network. And this was the idea that I presented to Chris. I didn't know how to do it, but this is how we have our system set up now. So there's, there's no way to get into the VMware machine. There's no way to get into the Veeam. It's not exposed to the internet in any way. It's only what we opened up inside the router. All right, honeypots, I don't have a lot of time, but um, Chris told me about this one thing I wanna share with you guys that I thought was really cool. You have a typical network, you got some servers and some workstations. Well, what if your router, if someone goes and does that ASP and gets the list of all the servers and computers that are on the network, well, why don't we tell it that we got four times as many computers as we actually do? But all of those computers aren't real. But if one computer starts trying to talk to those computers, hey, give me a list of your shares. Hey, give me a list of all your files. 
then we know that computer is not up to any good and the router just takes it off of the network. So this is a really cool idea. The problem is it's about $150,000 for that router, but it'd be nice to see something come in that was more affordable. Anyway, I'm gonna post this up so that you guys will have access to it. Chris Padgett, I wanna give him credit and I wanna thank Tamar, Rick and Doug. They are the best for keeping this, this going while everybody's going through difficult times. It's good to see everyone and please fill out your evaluations. And if you have any questions, um, you can email me. It might, might give me a couple of days to get caught up and but I will respond to any, any email requests. Okay, we have one more question, which is uh -huh. by, by trying to look bigger, does that make you a bigger target? Um, not necessarily, because once they've got in, they're going to poke around. So you're not necessarily making yourself bigger. You're just, you've created this fake, you've created a, uh, like a canary. Instead of a canary file, you create a canary computer. And if somebody's talking to that computer, you know they're up to no good. Okay, well, thanks very much. And of course, people can come catch you in the Q&A session room following if they have more questions for you. All right, great. Sounds okay. good. Thank you. You're welcome. And we are out. Good job. Well, thank you. Lots there. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot to go to go through. So now will you direct me over there? Or do I just join that session? Um, when you're ready, you'll hit le click leave here and then click the sessions thing on the left. Yep. And you'll see one that's labeled Q and A for yep. whatever for whatever. Okay. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.